Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on this Wednesday fall evening. I'm Christy Berger. I'm the director of school counseling and mental health for Center Grove Schools. And you are here for our body safety evening for a parent session to learn a little bit more about our new curriculum that we will be using K-5 with our students. And so I am gonna turn it over to Maggie here in a moment, but first wanted just to give a little background. Um, if you're new to Center Grove or if you have kindergarten students, we have provided body safety, um, body safety training, body safety education to our kids in K-5 for many years. We used to use Sergeant Terry Hall for that programming um, due to the Indiana code that we're required to teach that. However, this past year, we have switched our partnership and we are excited to be able to provide that prevention work to our students through K through 12th grade. And so we use Child and Teen Lures and we partner with Maggie and her team. And so she is gonna share a little bit about what your students would view if you, um, would like for them to participate. And then at the end, we will remind you again on how you can opt your child out if that is something you would like to do and the emails to reach out for that information. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Maggie Owens at this time. All right, thank you so much. Let me get my PowerPoint pulled up and get this all ready to go. So my name is Maggie Owens and I am the Director of Education and Community Relations for the Indiana Center for Prevention of youth abuse and suicide. We are located in Carmel, Indiana, and we are, have been doing body safety education for 21 years now at this point. Um, if you are familiar with the Central Indiana area, we were formerly known as Chaucey's Place, and we were started because a young girl named Chaucey had had her body safety rules broken by her father starting at a very young age, and he was sexually abusing her for years and years and years and telling her that it was her fault and telling her that it was their secret and all of the things that we need to make sure that our kids know so that they can talk to a trusted adult. Um, so her family started our organization so that kids like your kids are not experiencing the things that Chaucey experienced. So a little bit about who we are. We are a 501c3 and we are out of um, Carmel, Indiana. We are currently in about 11 counties in central Indiana and we are growing all of the time. Um, we provide body safety education and suicide prevention education um, for schools, for youth serving organizations, for churches, for a variety of different things. Um, rest assured that our child abuse prevention is very different than our suicide prevention. So if you see our name and you're concerned that your child is going to be learning about suicide prevention, that is not at all a part of our program that we're going to be offering in your kindergarten through fifth grade classrooms. We do offer that for those fifth through 12th grade classrooms when schools are interested in it. But just so that I can answer that question up front right now, we are not providing any kind of suicide prevention in the elementary level. We have five core programs that we offer. We offer Stewards of Children, which is a child sexual abuse prevention model for adults. And if you are interested in learning more about that, we offer that free of charge at once or twice a month. And you can find information about that on our website, which I will share in the chat at the end. We offer what we're going to be doing for your students, which is child lures and teen lures. We do child lures in kindergarten through fifth or sixth grade, depending on the makeup of the school. And teen lures is that middle school through high school. It is a spiraling curriculum, and I'll give you a lot more information about what is actually entailed in that curriculum, but that is one of our big programs we offer. We offer QPR, which is a suicide prevention program, and that is fantastic if you are in the world of dealing with people in any kind of capacity. Um, we do that for teachers and community members and a variety of different other groups. And then we offer lifelines and signs of suicide for our suicide prevention programs within the schools. And um, we, we are a 501c3, so we are grant funded. And because of that, we are able to offer our programs for little or no cost to the schools that we serve. So we get the question, why do we teach child abuse prevention? Obviously, because of the story of what happened to Chaucey, that is a big reason as to why we do offer child abuse prevention. But there are a couple of other reasons why as well. And I'm going to apologize now in advance. I have a beagle that is at high alert for something that is outside right now. And I can't figure out what it is. And the rest of my family was kicked out of the house tonight. So they 
can't help me figure out what it is that he is so bothered by. So I apologize about the dog barking. So here are a few child abuse statistics. We know that one in four children experience some form of childhood maltreatment. So that could be neglect, that could be medical neglect, emotional, emotional abuse. It can even be educational neglect, um, any kind of childhood maltreatment. And we're, so we're not just talking about sexual abuse or physical abuse, it can be any kind. But we do know that one in 10 children will be sexually abused by their 18th birthday. And as a mom, that's a really hard number for me to think about because I have two kids. And so that means that one in, there's a one in five chance that one of my kids are going to be sexually abused by their birthday. And as a mom, I want to do whatever I can to make sure that that doesn't happen to them. We know that children with disabilities are three times more likely to be victims of sexual abuse than their peers without a disability. We know that predators are inclined to target individuals with disabilities because they may not have the language or the ability to be able to express what's happening or to be able to tell that person to stop. So we find this very important to be able to put this information in front of all kids. So we're not just going in mainstream general education classrooms. We're able to provide this to the, a variety of kids in a variety of different ways, meeting their learning styles as they are. We know that 60% of all child sexual abuse victims will never tell. I have been around many adults that, have, that were abused as children and they didn't tell when they were a kid. And so we need to make sure that we are giving our children the voice to be able to say if something happens, if something makes them feel uncomfortable, if something makes them feel like their body is not being kept safe. Our job as grownups is to make sure that our kids are safe. And by providing this education, we are able to make sure that our kids are getting the language, the information, and knowing, identifying who they can talk to. And this is one that I know is hard for parents to hear because it's so different than what we heard as, as kids. In my childhood years, we learned about stranger danger, not trusting the people that were strangers to us. But what we know is that 90% of the time, the perpetrator is someone that both you and your children know and trust. It's not the stranger in the white van that is driving around trying to pick up kids. It's somebody that you know, somebody that you trust, somebody that has made a relationship with you and your children. That's the person that is going to be more likely to abuse your kids. And we know that females are five times more likely to be abused than males. So in 2018, a law was passed, SEA 355, and that mandate requires that every child in kindergarten through 12th grade receives body safety education every year. So previously we provided this program and it wasn't mandated by the state. However, we still did this because of the importance of it. Now, this mandate requires that it covers all forms of child abuse and bullying. So our curriculum is going to cover bullying, cyberbullying, um, child sexual abuse, and some other things. And I'll talk more specifically about the actual program, but the mandate does require that it covers all of these things. The mandate requires that it is research and evidence-based, so you can't just make up your own curriculum. So know that the curriculum that is being presented to your children is evidence-based. It has had gone through so much research and data collection to make sure that we are meeting the kids where they are developmentally, as well as providing them the most up-to-date information. And because of this mandate, no funding is given to the schools. So our team, we work very hard to find grant funding so that this is little to no cost for your schools. There may be a small cost associated with buying some of the materials, but as far as covering our time and our travel to get to your school, none of that is at a cost to your, to your school system. So all of that to say, all of that negative stuff about child abuse, there is good news. And the good news is that 95% of abuse is preventable through education. The more education these kids get, the more they are able to identify when something is uncomfortable, when something seems not quite right, and we're giving them the voice to be able to stand up for themselves. So just like you have taught your kids different ways to keep themselves safe, our body safety education is similar to what they already know. And we liken the things, the examples that we give them to the things that they already are doing. I always tell parents, 
you didn't tell your child one time to put their seatbelt on when they got in their car. They knew that because you're telling them over and over and over again to put their seatbelt on. So you have taught your child that particular way of body safety. Same thing with, with helmets, wearing sunscreen. Yes, there is that stranger danger where you're not taking candy, or you're not gonna go look at somebody's puppy that they say they've lost, or they have a new litter of baby rabbits that are in their yard. Those are the kinds of things that you have, as parents have already done. We're just building off of that to teach them additional ways to make sure that their body is safe. When we are in the classroom, we talk about how they practice a fire drill. There are fire drills that are scheduled throughout the school year, not because they are going to for sure have a fire drill, but because we want to make sure that they know what to do just in case there is a fire drill. And we say the same thing for our body safety. We're not teaching these kids about how to identify when their body is not being kept safe because for sure it's going to happen. We teach them these things so that if and when they are in that ex that situation, they know exactly what to do to make sure that their body is being kept safe and how to tell someone and what is okay and not okay. So when we teach our children about child abuse prevention, it's really no different. We use the language of thinking first and staying safe. Think about what's happening and then what do you need to do to make sure that you are staying safe? This is a conversation. We're teaching this in a very gentle, very casual way. And again, like I said, we're just like the fire drill, you're doing it just in case you're ever in a fire. We're teaching these body safety rules just in case you're ever in a situation that you are feeling unsafe. We also teach about being safe about people, understanding pe people safety skills. We're not giving examples about what actually happens in a kind of abuse. We're not talking about what actually happens in sexual abuse. We're talking about the fact that somebody might look at, touch, or take pictures of a private body part. So I know parents ask me all the time, are you talking to our kids about sex? And no, we are not talking to your kids about sex at all. We're not talking about specific graphic information about what that looks like. We're simply telling them that their body is theirs and they have these private parts that need to be kept safe. And so how do we make sure that they understand, A, what those private parts are and what does it mean to keep them safe? You will get a parent guide that will give you other tips and give you other information about how to have ongoing conversations at home. Our job as the body safety educators providing this education is just to open this door of communication so that you and your children can have this ongoing conversation about what that looks like. So the very important question that I get asked a lot, what are the concepts? What are these things that we're talking about in the think first and stay safe presentation? So again, this is a spiraling curriculum. So the information your kindergartner gets is going to look extremely different than the information that your fifth grader gets. We try and make the kids developmentally where they are. So in every grade, we talk about how their body is theirs. They have elbows, they have knees, they have a brain, they also have private parts, and it is the job of the people around them to make sure that their body is being kept safe, but that they also have a voice to stand up for the fact if their body is not being kept safe, that they know how to talk about it. So in those younger grades, we are talking about what the anatomical name of a body part is, and that's because if they ever go to somebody and say, Uncle Sue, Uncle Johnny touched my thingamajig. Somebody listening to that may not know what that is. So we're trying to make sure that these kids know that if they ever have to report that Uncle Johnny has touched their vagina, that they have that language and that ability to talk about what that is. So again, the proper names of body parts that we know that we tell people to stop any touches that make them feel uncomfortable. And when I am teaching in our, in our classrooms, I use the example of my own son. So I have a sixth grade boy who has never liked to be touched. Even as a baby, I can remember him being in that swaddle and not wanting to be swaddled, not wanting to be touched, not wanting to be rocked. And so I use that as an example for these kids that anytime anybody's touch makes you uncomfortable, you can tell them to stop. And so I say to the kids when I'm teaching them, 
When my sixth grader walks through the door after school, I always ask, how was your day? Can I give you a hug? And if he says, no, I can't give him a hug, that's okay because that hug might make him feel uncomfortable. Not because I've ever done anything to make him uncomfortable, but his body is his and he is allowed to advocate for what makes him feel okay and what makes him feel like he's not safe. Anybody can break body safety rules. So that can be other kids, other neighbors, that can be peers, that can be people online, that can be people in person, that can be adults, that can be teenagers, that there, anybody can do that. There's not one kind of person that they need to watch out for. They need to make sure that they are protecting themselves in any kind of situation. That we talk about the lures that can be used to trick children. Obviously in the younger grades, we're not talking about specific lures, but when we get into fourth and fifth grade, we might talk about bribery. We might talk about cyberbullying and electronic luring and how electronics play a part into making sure that these kids are not sharing personal information, not sharing what's happening in their home to these people that they might be playing a video game with. Not that they shouldn't be playing video games with people, but I use the example when I'm teaching that our kids, like my kids in my house, if they're playing a game and they're talking to their friends while they play that game, the only thing they need to be talking about is the game. They don't need to be talking about if mom or dad are home, where they live, where they go to school, what the garage code is at their house. They don't need to be talking about those things. And so these are the kinds of things that we're reminding your students about as well. One of the big things we talk about is trusting your gut. Your gut, we understand that as adults that you know we get, we get that uncomfortable feeling about something that maybe seems weird or makes us feel strange. We're teaching our your kids that same thing, that we have instincts, we have a siren that's in our belly and anything, any behavior that makes you feel sad, worried, scared, anxious, uncomfortable, um, any of that is your body's way of telling you to get out of that situation. We talk about telling a trusted adult in every classroom we go into, we talk, we make a list. We have a big poster that has hands and we talk about who are the adults in our lives? And we talk about how not everybody has the same adults. My mom is not going to be somebody else's trusted adult. And maybe some of these kids don't live with their mom or they don't live with their dad. And so they have to identify who their trusted adults are that they know they can talk to at any time. We talk about how all secrets can be told. What we know is so many times abusers tell these kids to keep a secret. And then we also know that so many times kids tell another friend what's happening, but then they tell them to keep it a secret. So we have to make sure our, our students, our children are equipped with the information to be able to share if somebody else has told them this is happening, if somebody is doing this to them and they have been told to keep it a secret. So we talk about what is the kind of secret that you tell. And so that changes a kindergarten secret versus a fifth grade secret just based on their knowledge and their you know, awareness of the world. But we really try and use real life examples, things that we know happen in order to make sure that your kids have a good grasp on what's what we're talking about. And we also talk about how everyone deserves to be treated with kindness and respect, but that also means that we need to make sure we're treating other people with kindness and respect. In the older grades, we talk about how making up a story about something like this could actually get them in trouble. And so it's important to always remember that you don't make up stories about any kind of abuse and you don't make up stories about any kind of bullying, but that if something like this does happen, you need to make sure you talk about it and talk about it to somebody that you know can help you solve that problem. And the last thing we talk about across kindergarten through 12th grade, that if something like this happens, any kind of abuse or bullying is never the child's fault of the person who's getting hurt. It's always the fault of the person that is doing the hurting. And that's a really important thing because I don't know if any of you as children were abused or sexually abused, but there comes with that a lot of shame and a lot of feeling like it's your fault that you did something wrong and that's why it's happening to you. 
So we want to make sure that these kids know it's never their fault. If it, if it has happened or ever does happen, we want to make sure that they know it's not their fault. So just like any other professional, we come with a variety of tools that we bring with us. One being anatomically correct dolls. We are using these dolls in kindergarten through second grade. You can see they look pretty much like a Cabbage Patch doll, but they do have the anatomically correct body parts. Um, we talk about them simply by the names of those body parts. Um, we talk, we, we upfront say like, we know this is going to make you a little uncomfortable because you don't normally talk about your private parts at school. And you shouldn't be talking about or showing people your private parts. But that's how we introduce the language of what the, the proper names are of body parts. We come with other props. So child luring is the name of what these things that these, these people do to lure kids into unsafe situations. So we come with a fishing lure and we talk about how that fishing lure looks like a fish. And so another fish is gonna bite onto that and be tricked. So we use different props to kind of parallel the, the language that we use so that these kids have an understanding. We use a fishing lure to trick a fish. What kinds of things would trick a, a kid? video games, money, candy, puppies, those kinds of things, so that they can have real life examples of what it is that we're talking about. I mentioned that poster. Here is the poster that we, we use to write the names of our trusted adults. That poster is then left in your child's classroom as a reference point so that people can reinforce what those ideas are. We also very much talk about how somebody's trusted adults are going to be different than somebody else's trusted adults. Maybe they have a trusted adult that is doing some unsafe things to them. So we remind them that they have all of these other adults in their life that they can talk about. I get the question a lot, who are these people that are coming into my child's classroom to talk about this very important and very sensitive subject matter? And I can tell you that all of our body safety specialists have a background in education, psychology, social work, or counseling. And we do that for a reason, because this is important conversation. And we never want the information to be relayed in a way that is not appropriate and is not accurate. So I have a master's in curriculum and instruction. And so I am the director of education. So I train all of our individuals that go out. I have a post master's in social emotional learning, and I'm working on my educational specialist degree to be, you know, because I find learning very important. And all of our people that work for me have a degree that relates to doing this. They are, they are trained in a very intensive training program. We do shadowing, we do role playing. We never put a person in front of a classroom of kids until I believe that they are ready. So I have watched every person present this information across a variety of grade levels before I ever put them alone in front of your students. Additionally, we have been background checked in across the country in their background check. So it's not just an Indiana background check. So. We make sure that nobody has any kind of criminal history, especially with children. We make sure that they can pass fingerprinting. So just rest assured that we're not putting anybody in your schools that are going to be of any harm to your students. I mean, obviously we know that in schools in general that any volunteer has to pass a certain variety of a background check. We take it well above and beyond that because we want you as parents to feel safe with the people that we are putting in front of your students. This is an example of what the parent guide will look like. Every parent in the school is going to get this and it just provides different topics, different talk points, a refresher of what the information we share with your students so that you can have ongoing conversations at home. So I get the question, what can I do? How can I be involved? What can I do to make sure that my child feels safe, feels comfortable with this information? And the biggest things I would say is to keep the conversation casual. I mean, my husband is a pastor and I do this work. And so obviously we have some you know, sensitive conversations around our dinner table, but we never want the 
the conversation about body safety to be uncomfortable for our kids. We talk about it in a very casual way. We remind them, you know, when we're leaving for a date night and they're having a babysitter to make sure that they are reminding them to talk about anything that makes them feel uncomfortable to change in their bedroom with the door closed that if they're having a sleepover we don't have doors closed on sleepovers because we want to make sure that anything is interruptible and seen and we make sure that any of the parents that send their children to our house understand that as well we want to make sure this is an ongoing conversation between you you and your student that's why we come back every year because the kids need to hear this more than one time. They need to hear it over and over again as a refresher. And so you participating in this and having this ongoing conversation helps us and helps your students as well. Learning the lures. So being looking up information about what kinds of things are being done to lure kids into unsafe situation. Knowing the people that your child is around. So my my kids are very fortunate in the fact that they their two their best friends are siblings and so oftentimes my two kids go to their house to spend the night and their two kids might come to our house and spend the night but they also have an older sibling and they have a sibling that is 17 years old and so when my kids go over to their house i i trust the family wholeheartedly 100 percent but I ask them, is that 17 year old having any friends over? And what do I need to know about the people that are going to be over with him? Not because I'm worried about any of them, but because my job as their parent is to make sure that they're being kept safe. And if you want any other information or talking, re talking points or resources, our website is www.indianaprevention.org. And we have a plethora of information and about how to ask questions, what to do for a sleepover, how to make sure that your child is being kept safe at summer camp, those kinds of things, as well as just ongoing resources for how to have this sensitive conversation with your kids, especially if in the situation that your child does disclose that they have had something happen to their body, how to appropriately respond to that. No parent ever wants to hear that, but making sure that you are prepared to answer and respond appropriately is going to make such a difference in the ongoing health of that child. So if you still have questions, you can visit our website. You can email us at contact at Indiana Prevention. That comes directly to me. And our, website, or our phone number is 317-759-8008. Obviously, I think that you can tell that I'm very passionate about this. I think that every child needs to have an opportunity to be given a voice. And so this program, I was a former teacher, I am a mom, and I would never once want to think of a child not having this information to be able to share. Um, it is extremely important. And so if you do have questions or you have any concerns, please reach out to me because I wanna make sure that you feel comfortable with our people that are going to be presenting this information to your children. Thanks, Maggie. We do have one question um, and it was asking if you could explain a little bit more about the doll that's being shown. Um, that's the body part. So I think you mentioned it looks kind of like a cabbage patch doll. Yes. And if I, I have one in my car, too bad I didn't bring one in and I could show you that it, I mean, it just looks like a cabbage patch doll. And so when we talk about, you know, our, our body parts, everybody has a bathing suit zone. So parts of the body that are covered and protected by your bathing suit. And so I just say, and those parts are breast, a bottom and a vagina or breast, bottom and a penis. And that's it. A quick quick information about that and then the dolls go back away and we just continue to talk about it from the the bathing suit zone perspective that it's against the law for people to look at touch or take pictures or videos of your bathing suit zone or ask you to look at touch or take pictures of their bathing suit zone awesome and then we had a question um are the students separated boys and girls they are not we do do that for our health ed pros talk, which is more about um, sexuality and uh, parts of the body, hormones, 
all that fun stuff. We do separate for that conversation, but because this conversation is really truly based around um, just safety in general, we keep the class together for that. Something that is different from last year and years before was we used to bring together a grade level and they would come hear the presentation. This will be a um, somebody from Maggie's team that will come into each individual class and have that conversation with those students there. So it's it's much more smaller group, safer group. Um, the kids feel that they can share there. The teachers involved um, by participating in the discussion as well. And you'll see that there is a place at the bottom to submit any other questions. While you are doing that, I did want to let everyone know that we do have an opt-out form. And so all of those forms have been sent to your child's school. So if you would like for your student to not participate, um, rather you'd like to discuss this conversation at home, we understand that and respect that. And we just ask that you reach out to myself or to your school counselor to ask for that form and to sign off on that form. It is all kept within the school. So if you could reach out to your point of contact at the school, that would be wonderful. But if you aren't sure who that is, you could reach out to me. Um, and I did kind of just want to run through the dates why I have them up here just to remind people. Uh, Maple Grove will be our first elementary that goes through the pre presentation and they will receive that information on October 20th and 21st. Pleasant Grove will receive that October 27th and 28th. Walnut Grove, October 31st and November 1st. North Grove, uh, November 3rd and November 4th. Center Grove Elementary, November 10th and 11th. And then our Sugar Grove will not go until February 9th and 10th. And so just wanted to share those dates so that when your child um, is getting that information, like Maggie said, it's so important to have that conversation at home. And so when um, your child participates, they will get a parent booklet that will go home with them. Um, so you'll know, be reminded that they had that information that day to have some of those talking points. If your child does not participate, we will not send that booklet home with them. Um, we had a wondering of, will my daughter be shown a penis on a male doll? Everybody is shown the parts of the body on the male doll and the female doll. And again, this is just a very, I mean, it is anatomically correct. It is a very brief view of a puppet penis, if you will. I mean, it's not anything that looks, I mean, the kids are uncomfortable, not because they are uncomfortable with the content, but because it's something that they're not used to hearing about at school. And so it is a, a very quick flash, just so that there is a visual um, understanding of what those private parts are. You would be amazed how many boys don't realize that they shouldn't just be showing their, their penis to people and how many girls don't think that they should not be flashing their breasts to people. So for some of these kids, it's just a good reminder about how to make sure that they are keeping themselves safe. I had a question from a parent just last week, I think, that said that they had never once had a conversation talking about what the proper names of body parts were with their kids. And they didn't know how to how to start that conversation because they had talked about the male parts with their male and their their female parts with the female, but never talked about what the names of those other parts were. And it really is just important for kids to have that language, not because they need to know what the purpose of that body part is. By no means are we talking about what the purpose of these body parts are. It's just so that if something does happen and somebody shows them a penis, they can say, whoever showed me their penis, instead of saying somebody showed me their grapes or whatever it is that they choose to use in that situation. It's important for them to know, not because we're trying to indoctrinate kids or we're not trying to show too much sexualized information. We are truly trying to make sure that kids have the language and the vocabulary to discuss what might or has happened to them. Thanks for that, Maggie. Any other questions? Please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll share them out. In addition to that, if you would like a recording of the Zoom tonight, please feel free to reach out to me at Berger, B-E-R-G-E-R-C for Christy at centergrove.com or .k12.in.us and I will send that to you. And then my email, somebody just asked for it and I put it in there, but my email is Maggie, M-A-G-G-I-E 
at indianaprevention.org. And if you don't remember that, you can go to our website, which is just indianaprevention.org. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see my, my picture and then my email. And so feel free. I am happy to answer any questions or talk to anybody on the phone if there are additional conversations. Yep. And one more question we had was, um, K2 is only body safe here. Is bullying a part of that too? Uh, we talk about all types of safety within that. And so body safety is part of it, but as Maggie shared, they touch on some other parts as well. Um, in addition to our school counselors and school social workers talk to all grade levels about our bullying procedures and how to report bullying yep. by October 15th. So that will be completed if it has not already by our school counselors as well. Yeah, we touch on bullying, but we know that your school does such a fantastic job about talking about your building specific policies and procedures that we just talk about what bullying is, what is cyberbullying, talk to a trusted adult if this is happening or if you see it happening. And we really leave the specifics to the school. I also see another question about um, talking about male and female, not what they identify it as. We definitely do not talk about what individuals identify as, as far as their sexuality or their gender. We typically talk about these are the parts that people have. And so we don't, um, we do not talk about anything beyond what our bodies are made of. Thanks, Maggie. I was just typing that answer. All right. Well, if you have any other questions, please feel free to continue to add those in the chat, um, but go ahead and stay on if you have questions, but feel free to go back to your evening. Again, we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us tonight and encourage you to reach out to your school counselor, school social worker for specifics on your school's presentations.